The Last Question. Professor Vrei, tra le tante ipotesi proposte per mantenere in vita il progetto dell'Unione Monetaria Europea, c'è quello di costituire una banca centrale sul modello della Federal e costituire una sorta di unione di stati federali sulla base dell'assetto attuale degli Stati Uniti. A suo avviso, quel modello potrebbe essere importato con successo in Europa? In caso contrario, data la minaccia di deflazione alle porte, per gli Stati del Sud si profila l'urgente necessità di stabilire un piano per uscire dall'euro. Potrebbe elencarci i punti critici di questo passaggio per salvaguardare le economie delle nazioni più deboli? Quali ripercussioni potrebbero avere gli Stati Uniti da un tale evento? Professor Bray, one of the hypotheses proposed to keep the European Monetary Union project alive is to establish a central bank modeled on Fed and create some kind of federal states union on the basis of the current system in the United States. In your opinion, could that model be successfully imported to Europe? If not, given the upcoming deflation threat, it's urgent for southern states to plan a euro exit. In this case, could you point out the related critical points in order to preserve weaker nations' economies? In this event, what implications could affect the United States? Well, I, th I think um, that uh, th this initiative <clears throat> is on the wrong track. Um, you don't need to um, uh, revise the, the ECB to make it more like the Fed, because that really is not your problem. The, the, the problem is the fiscal policy, not the monetary policy. Uh, Claudio Sardoni from University of Rome and I did a paper some years ago. We, we compared the policies of the ECB and the Fed and found no difference at all in terms of interest rate setting, which is the main thing that central banks do. Now, uh, that was before the crisis hit, okay? After the crisis hit, what did they do? Well, again, pretty similar things. Um, and the ECB did things that it promised it would never do, <laughs> such as helping to prop up the debt of individual uh, member nations. So, uh, I, I, I honestly, I don't understand the, uh, the hostility to the ECB and the love of the Fed, <laughs> because I don't see them as operating very much differently at all. I think the, the problems in Europe have to do with the fiscal arrangements not the monetary policy arrangements. So what you really need to do is get a unified fiscal policy, not uh, try to adopt this decentralized central bank that we have in the United States, which I think actually is a mistake and probably was a mistake even in 1913, but it's certainly a mistake now. And, and in fact, our um, district banks really have no power. The power is all in Washington now anyway. So I, I don't see much difference there. Um, on the, the, the euro exit, you know, I, I think this is probably really too costly for um, member nations to do. I, I think that exiting the euro is probably not a good strategy. It could be a good bargaining strategy if the periphery nations get together and say, look, either you do this or we're all going to leave together. I think that as a bargaining strategy, that, that could be a good thing. Uh, I don't think that this is the, the best path for the future. The best path is to try to um, create um, a fiscal power that is sufficient to deal with the crisis now but also to ensure that you operate at full employment going forward. So a long-term strategy too. And what it's going to take is um, probably something like 10 to 15 percent of Europe's GDP that can be created in the center. Uh, and that means perhaps running big budget deficits, maybe as high as 10 percent of GDP. That's what we hit in the um, global financial crisis, but maybe on average about 5% of GDP. So this is a, a fiscal distribution to all the member nations. 
so that they would get an amount equal to, say, 10% of um, their own uh, GDP, or you can do it on a per capita basis, that they are free to spend in order to maintain full employment and maintain the, the infrastructure um, and to raise the living standards on the periphery up to the living standards in the wealthier nations. So I think that it's fiscal policy. Um, I'm not sure about the, the implications for the United States. I think it, it would be a good thing if, um, they, if Europe could uh, start growing and solve its unemployment problem and uh, if Germany didn't have to act as a modern mercantilist nation that is trying to export its way toward full employment, I think this would be good for the world, not just the United States, not just for Europe. Beg your pardon, just a question. Okay. We totally agree that on the long track, a unified fiscal policy in Europe could be the final answer. I mean, this would lead us again back to the situation in which the United States now are, which is with a sovereign currency that we actually don't have. On the other side, fiscal unity in Europe is considered an option that won't be available before 50 years. <laughs> yeah. This was stated by Romano Prodi and he was one of the founders of the European Union. Now, considering this scenario, is it acceptable in your opinion that we stay in a monetary union without a fiscal or political union? Okay, so I, I need to make this clear. You, uh, Italy and other nations will not tolerate the center telling you how to spend your money. And I think that's what Prodi is talking about. And I, I can see that, I agree with that. You want to have control of fiscal policy within Italy. Okay, this is perfectly understandable. And it will take 50 years to change uh, the thinking and to give the power in the center. So what I'm talking about is not doing that. I'm talking about the uh, money coming from the center, but all the decisions made in Italy on how to spend it. So I'm talking about um, uh, uh, grants from the center, perhaps on a per capita basis, to Italy. Italy formulates its own fiscal policy, so it's supplemental euros that Italy can spend beyond what Italy can spend right now based on its tax revenue and the bonds it can sell. Okay, so this is a fiscal grant to Italy supplementing um, the uh, available spending power of the Italian government. So you don't surrender any decision making. Okay, and I, I think this is something you could do next year. Just say. I see, okay. but so you, according to Germany, when they accepted that to enter the euro, they put black and white that there will never be any fiscal movement from one state member to another. Uh, but see, this would not come from Germany. Germany would get the same thing. All of you would get it. Germany would get it too. So, That's what makes in any case, we need to change this scenario if you want a euro to be acceptable. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, you know, there, there are two reasons why um, there was a, why it was set up the way that it was set up. Okay, it was set up to uh, fight inflation. So we want to ensure that governments are very constrained so that they won't cause inflation. And I, w I was in Italy at the time when the euro was adopted. And uh, even my good heterodox post-Keynesian economist friends supported the euro. Why? Because Italy has uh, a bias towards inflation. And they thought that this way we're going to constrain the government's spending and it's going to bring down inflation. Okay? Well, it sort of worked, right? <laughs> so you get rid of the inflation and instead you have very high unemployment. Okay? And you have your infrastructure deteriorating. Every year that I go back to Italy, I see things are worse. It's worse, okay? So this is what you got. You got rid of inflation. You got a much worse economy, okay? 
maybe you might like a little bit of inflation. Maybe you could settle for that. All right. The, the second reason was because the, the founders, and I think still many people today, believe that sovereign governments are like households. And that is that they either have to tax, which is their income, or they got to borrow. And that printing money is terrible because printing money always leads to Weimar Republic, hyperinflation. And this is what MMT has been trying to, to argue and show and prove that it's false. That governments always spend by crediting bank accounts. It doesn't cause hyperinflation. It doesn't cause national insolvency. Insolvency um, of a government can only occur if you don't issue your own currency. If you issue your own currency, solvency is never a question. Now, inflation is a question. Okay, so you have to ensure that you don't spend beyond full employment um, because that will definitely cause inflation. But also, you have to direct the spending in a manner that doesn't cause inflation. That's one of the reasons why we really like the job guarantee because it ensures full employment but without setting off inflation because it's a buffer stock program. All you're doing is paying the basic wage that can't be inflationary. So you need to design your fiscal policy in a way that it won't cause inflation. So you got to fight these two, uh, I think, um, flawed arguments. One is that governments are naturally biased towards causing inflation. I don't think that this is true. And the second is that um, governments are nationally biased towards spending so much that they get themselves into a, a debt uh, problem. Neither of these things are true. Okay, so we can stay in Europe, but in a completely different Europe that reverses its economic approach. That uh, is true. Uh, I get, okay. But, you know, the MMT is being understood around the world. And, you know, when I'm out of, um, say, the Bank of England now, it looks like MMT. Uh, and uh, the, some of the statements at the Fed also. So I think the ideas are getting out and people are starting to understand. And remember the, the Rogoff and Reinhardt claim that once you read it, reach a 90% debt ratio, then uh, you get all sorts of bad things happening. And it, it turned out their um, analysis was completely flawed. And people are now going back and starting to understand that the, the biggest mistake they made was they threw all kinds of um, uh, government regimes together. Fixed exchange rates, floating exchange rates, uh, issuing debt in foreign currency, issuing debt in your own currency, threw them all together and we get complete nonsense. When you finally separate those out, what you find is governments that issue their own currency never face solvency problems. They don't have debt crises in their own currency. Thank you for this interview, Professor Bray. I hope that we'll have the option to meet you in Italy soon. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again. All right. Bye.